Hello and good evening and welcome to this uh, public meeting for the recording in progress for this public meeting for the Don't Extradite Assange uh, campaign. Um, thanks all for being here wherever you are in the world. Um, we're going to open with Kristen from Wikileaks and John from the campaign um, who will give us their reflections on what this news about the Supreme Court on Monday means and a bit of an explainer. And uh, then we'll just open it up for discussion with you all, your questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions. So um, perhaps Kristen, you can start us off. Um, can you explain what is what is what are these latest developments? Well, what happened on Monday was that uh, the, uh, uh, the High Court uh, decided to, uh, to that they would uh, agree on one question to be passed on to, to the Supreme Court uh, in the Assange case. Uh, formally, they objected to, to the appeal to the Supreme Court, but that's a formality. Of course, they wouldn't say that their own uh, decision was, was wrong and, and, and needed uh, further scrutiny. Uh, but uh, importantly, they decided this one question uh, might be of interest to the Supreme Court, and it might be a case to uh, to put it there uh, for for a, a second opinion. Now, uh, it, it's a Im very important question. Uh, it is the question whether it uh, was permissible for the uh, Americans to present the so-called assurances in the appeal process. Uh, which were absent in the magistrate court. Uh, and these so-called assurances, of course, were the basis of the finding, or the main basis of the finding of the appeal court to overturn the magistrate court decision and allow the extradition. Now, so it's a, it's a very important question uh, for the Supreme Court to, to scrutinize. From a layman's perspective, it seems absolutely absurd that a party who loses a case in the lower court uh, is allowed to present such uh, 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 evidence or, or arguments in the appeal process, which is a totally new thing, uh, which was never discussed in the, in the, in the lower court. It, is, uh, it, it looks absurd that they are allowed to do that. But even the high court in its decision and the overturning of uh, Judge Barrett's uh, ruling uh, were commenting that uh, actually Brecher should have pointed out to the Americans that they should have amended their case in the, uh, the lower court. I mean, how on earth can that be a, a sensible and uh, a fair thing to demand of a, a, a judge to, um, uh, uh, to allow or even encourage uh, one party to change the way that they present their case? Now let's go into these assurances for those who are not familiar with it. This, these are assurances that the Americans came up with after they lost the case, uh, that they would treat Julian fairly and uh, uh, in, in United States prisons once uh, he was extradited to United States. Uh, they said that he would get uh, proper medical attention, uh, that uh, he would uh, uh, not be housed in, in, in a specific uh, supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, uh, that he would not be placed under so-called SAMS, which is an acronym for Special Administrative Measures, which means torture in layman's term. It means uh, uh, a total isolation, uh, solitary confinement, basically and that he would be able to uh, uh, serve his time if and when sentenced in Australia. Now, all of, this, all of these uh, uh, arguments are inherently in themselves, uh, no arguments at all to, to amend their case. Uh, there are a lot of prisons that are just as bad as Supermax in Florence, Colorado. Uh, those SAMs is just one uh, sort of tool that uh, the US prison system has to keep people in total isolation and under solitary confinement. There are tens of thousands of prisoners in the United States under solitary confinement. Only a small fraction are under those SAMs, so they do have other means. Uh, and in terms of the, 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 this, this, this offer to uh, serve a sentence in Australia, is uh, uh, 
uh, does not, of course, take into effect that uh, in pre-trial, which could be two or three years, Julia would be under solitary confinement in a prison in the U.S. And uh, it is uh, uh, technically not possible to to ask for a transfer to to serve in another country until you, you have exhausted all your options options legally in a country for appeals. So that would mean that Julian would have to sit in, in a prison in the United States for maybe 10, 10 15 years before he could um, ask for such a thing. And on top of all this, the Americans actually put into those assurances a clause where they retain the right to change their mind and withdraw this at any given point for whatever reason they deemed was uh, appropriate. So it's not worth anything, these assurances. They are not worth anything that has been deemed by everybody who has looked into uh, the details of uh, the assurances. Amnesty International basically has said, this is not worth the paper it's written on, these diplomatic assurances, so-called. So it's two things. One, inherently, this is meaningless papers. And secondly, it's very critical they were allowed to present it into the proceedings. So. Uh, so naturally, this is the, 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 the very important thing to be, uh, be discussed in the Supreme Court. Uh, so if you had any faith in uh, the legal process, you would expect the Supreme Court to, to rule that, of course, this was not permissible. This is not worth anything. This is totally changes uh, the, the, the case. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I would have to say that my belief in the UK justice system has uh, um, has become very limited given the experience and my experience in the in UK courtrooms over the last years. So I would not be too uh, 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 hopeful of the outcome there, but it's a small victory that the, the High Court at least uh, acknowledged this was something that possibly needed more scrutiny. But um, uh, I have to be very cynical when it comes to any hopes in that this means that Julian will walk free. And let's not forget, that it will take a, a quite a bit of time for the Supreme Court to decide whether they actually will hear the case. Um, that is not a given fact. And uh, uh, on Monday, I heard of another case where actually a, a person had to wait four months for an answer to the question, will the Supreme Court take up the case? So another four months with Julian sitting in Belmont's prison. So what could happen? It could happen then in uh, three or four months, the Supreme Court said, yes, we will hear this case. Uh, you can present this in a courtroom in three or four months. Then they will take three, and, uh, four, three to four months to deliberate. So this may, means another year, another year for Julian in prison which means basically uh, for me to, to see this as uh, an extension of uh, the, uh, the torturous uh, uh, process, which obviously is being uh, handed uh, towards Julian. This is punishment by process. So uh, this is the situation uh, legally as we are in now, but, uh, my reflection of the whole thing, this entire saga, is, is this, what has been um, shown, I think, uh, in, in no uncertain terms, is that uh, this is not a, a legal question we're dealing with. This is not, has, has, has to do with the law at all or, 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 a, or a normal legal process. The political aspect of this case it has been sort of brought to the surface through the procedure through the anomalies that, that are obvious in every state of this case. So that is the, the, the bitter reality of it. And more and more people are seeing this as a reality. And more and more people are coming on board supporting Julian because of this. There is no fairness. There is no justice in this process. Thank you. So thanks for explaining what, what the latest means, uh, a bit from a legal point of view. Um, John, do you want to give us a sense of what this means in terms of campaigning and politi politically? 
um, you know, obviously this is this is dragging out, but it is a it is a bit of a win. How how do you see this for? I mean, this is an amazing audience as, as always from so many different countries: time Sydney, LA, Finland, Chile, Mexico, you name it, New York. So so what does it mean in terms of everyone who's 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 campaigning around the world? How how, how what does this mean? Do you think? Well, I think there's one very important sort of campaigning aspect of this decision that we should pay attention to, and uh, and that's this. We've always said, um, right from the very beginning, that this was a political trial, that it wasn't a normal legal case, uh, well, a normal criminal case in any sense whatsoever. And uh, this whole business of diplomatic assurances underlines that. It, it isn't normal. Um, for a sovereign state to interfere or to intervene in the judicial proceedings in another sovereign state with a diplomatic note, which explains after the ruling has been given, um, that, oh, 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 we didn't mean that, uh, and, and this is to reassure you that we're going to behave completely differently than we said we were going to behave during the actual trial. Uh, what that is in straightforward language is the United States relying on its so-called uh, special relationship uh, with the UK and with the UK political system uh, to insist that its word after the fact must be taken into account um, and the judgment reversed. That's what that means. It says, you know, you guys, you know, this court in England, you can't possibly say that the United States isn't acting in good faith, that it's not um, a, a, a reputable uh, government that you must take seriously, and therefore you've got to believe these assurances. That's the pitch. That's the, the, po the politics of what's going on. Now, the fact that there is politics going on uh, demonstrates that we're not in a, a normal legal proceedings. We're in a, a, a political offensive against the free press, and to make an example out of Julian Assange uh, so that a free press can't operate um, any longer. And this method of dealing with it, uh, both the accusations themselves, of course, the whole framing of the trial, but this intervention in that process makes it absolutely clear that, it's, that it, if, for instance, this part of the judgment uh, is finally upheld, it will be upheld because the United States politically, the United States government, politically intervene in this process to reverse a judgment which had gone against them. And, you know, not surprisingly, perhaps um, senior members of the British judiciary didn't turn around and say, oh, come on, guys, you know, you're having a laugh here. Uh, we don't trust your assurances. We don't uh, agree that you even delivered them in a timely and legitimate fashion. So that's question. I mean, so it's good that that question is going to the Supreme Court. And that's a, a, a good thing to be campaigning on, to say this proves it was political. They're intervening to move the goalposts after the judgment because they didn't like the judgment. The Supreme Court should chuck it out. And that's, you know, that's a strong argument for campaigners, uh, for campaigners uh, to take up. Okay, thank you. Um, so feel free to pop questions in because we're going to have a bit of a, you know, a meeting discussion format. Um, we know some folks had been asking um, previously about the issue of bail. Um, can somebody speak to that, please, about uh, what, what are the, what is the bail, you know, situation, the odds of, of Julian getting bail? Well, of course, we have, we have, uh, a bail application has been uh, uh, set forth and has been denied uh, previously. Uh, so this is in the hand of the lawyer, what they uh, and Julian think is tactically uh, right to, um, to you do in this uh, scenario. Uh, I am certain that this is just being considered now again, given the, uh, the new sort of uh, uh, timeline that we are facing in terms of uh, seeing this going possibly to the Supreme Court, and I hopefully likely it will. Uh, but uh, you know, I, this is this is something that I would not uh, like to go into in details because uh, the decision on that matter is Julian's decision in uh, with his lawyers. Uh, but uh, I can assure people that, that because I've heard 
uh, many being surprised that this has not been done already. Uh, it, uh, I, I understand very well the reason why it wasn't uh, uh, feasible to do it until we had this decision, uh, but I, we should hear uh, something about that, uh, that scenario uh, pretty soon. Um, it, it's a slim possibility that, uh, uh, that he would be freed. I don't believe that uh, uh, given the, uh, the past history that, uh, that he, he will be allowed out on bail. Uh, but it, is, it has crossed the, all the, the red lines that have been set out by human rights organizations. So it is certainly a scenario that uh, has is being followed and looked into in very in, in, in details. I can assure people that uh, when you cross the threshold of uh, staying in locked in as an innocent person under any circumstances for more than one thousand days, uh, as in the case of Julian, he is a remand prisoner. It's a very important to to uh, keep that in mind. You are crossing a line which is condemned in other countries uh, and uh, seriously condemned. And the European Court of Human Rights have uh, taken up uh, similar cases on, on the basis that this is absolutely unacceptable to keep somebody on inside uh, waiting a decision in the, in the courts for so long. A uh, thousand days, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a torturous situation as everybody could understand. I want to add a little bit to the uh, assurances which came to my mind uh, today, actually. I was reflecting back about all the, all the uh, abnormalities in the handling of, of, of Julian's case from the beginning, and it's been now more than a decade. Uh, I don't know how, pe how far back people remember this, but uh, Sweden was asking, wanting him extradited to Sweden for questioning. Uh, where he was never charged and the case was eventually dropped. Uh, Julian's lawyer were asking the Swedish uh, executive whether they could give diplomatic assurances that he would not be extradited onward to America. The Swedes said that, that is totally impossible. States do not make assurances like that. You, you can't even ask that. We can't intervene in processes in that matter. And it's off the table totally. And I was asking this. I was talking uh, uh, directly, uh, well, through the media to the politicians in Sweden. We're not asking you to intervene in a judicial process. We are asking for a political statement in Sweden saying that, of course, we would never extradite an individual, a publisher, to a country to, uh, to face trial for the simple work of doing journalism. Please say that, the, the, that's assurances. Those are assurances, but no, wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't even consider it. So now 10 years on, uh, the high court in London is taking a piece of paper with meaningless assurances and reversing the decision on the basis of that. I mean, how absurd this entire saga is. It isn't about the law at all. No. Um, and, and as John was saying earlier, so many endless twists and turns in the process. You know, it's hard to keep, keep up and remember, as you say, you know, no assurances when they're needed from Sweden, but, but now, yeah. Okay, there's a question that's come up from a few people. I see Magnus, Michael Seymour, someone else also raised this. Um, and, and I think the gist of it is the appeal is sort of on this narrow scope of assurances in the Supreme, hopefully in the Supreme Court. But what are the options of um, appealing on the, on the real substance of the cases? Will there be an opportunity for that? And let's just say hi to Deepa Driver. I'm sure many of you know Deepa is, is an official legal observer for, for the case. Um, so Deepa, um, we're just asking this question about um, you know, hopefully there'll be an appeal in the Supreme Court on this issues of the introduction of assurances. But what about the more substantive points in the case? Um, you know, political 
persecution and extradition and freedom of press, all those issues. Will there be an opportunity for Julian to appeal on those points? A few people are asking. And I think somebody has pointed to a response maybe Stella has made on this, but it will be great to hear um, if, if you all have thoughts on that. Well, I mean, in, uh, the simple answer is this. If the Supreme Court uh, upholds the decision of the uh, appeal court, and decides that Julian should be extradited, the case goes formally to uh, the Minister of Interior uh, to sign that off. Uh, but at that point, maybe in a year's time, uh, Julian's lawyer can actually appeal that decision on their terms. Remember that the appeal process earlier were on the narrow points that uh, the uh, Americas lost on. Uh, the questions of Julian's health and uh, suicide risk and the, the, the prison conditions in the United States. So in the appeal process, there was never any discussion about the actual uh, uh, merits of the case, uh, the, uh, the, um, the violations against Julian's rights in the process, the spying on his lawyers, the fact that, that one of the key witnesses in the, the uh, uh, American's case has withdrawn the testimony and uh, so blown a hole, uh, blow a hole in the, the uh, uh, important points in the indictment against Julian, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many issues that you could then discuss. And uh, as somebody pointed out, maybe this was a tactical way in the lower court to uh, basically side with the American on all arguments, but not extradite on the basis of, of, of health consideration and prison conditions, thereby avoiding the big questions being debated in an appeal court, or at least delaying that. So there is a possibility of another round in, a, in an appeal process, maybe a year down the road. So we might be talking about another year. So it is, it is a, a possibility, the fight is not over, but it's a fight, I must say, which is uh, being fought while Julian is sitting in this horrible condition in Belmont, punishment by process. Yeah. Um, you want to say something, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I, I hope you can hear me, I'm sorry. I've um, so I, th I think one of the things that people have to recognize is that throughout this case, it, is, it has always been that unlike a, in, you know, in any other reasonable court process where you would have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that somebody is guilty or prove on the balance of probabilities that somebody is guilty, in extradition law and in particular in relation, in given the US-UK extradition treaty, there is a presumption that Julian will be extradited. And so at the initial stage, it was his lawyers trying to make the case that there are some reasons why he should not be extradited, which is to the various bars to extradition. And once you've discussed it and framed the conversation initially in the form of those bars, what gets discussed is the subjects around those bars. It doesn't come back to the basic issues, which are of democracy, journalism, free press, free speech. Although his lawyers have done a fantastic job trying to bring those factors in through other ways. I think the next thing to understand is that this, is, this case is not one where justice will prevail through the court process. Whether we have a, a magistrate who, um, who's a presiding magistrate who has serious conflicts of interest, Lady Emma Arbuthnot, her husband has relationships with the intelligence services, her son runs a company that shuts down places like WikiLeaks, she herself has accepted hospitality from the FCO and others. And so there are serious concerns about judicial impartiality, not even at the stage of Emma Arbuthnot, but even at the stage of, the, of Judge Snow and... Um, Taylor, where they say things like, oh, he's a narcissist after he has said his name and said he's not guilty. So the judicial process is, seems to me to be extremely um, biased against this individual. It's a little bit like Guantanamo, 
you pretend that something is outside the scope of the law, as in Guantanamo, and here with the extradition law, they do it through a slightly better facade. They pretend that it, because of the treaty, it's outside the law, even though the treaty has an exception for political prisoners. They pretend that what he's done is, oh, it's not just espionage, i.e. publishing, but it is also this conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. And anybody who's looked at the details of that charge can see very clearly that that conspiracy, A, wasn't successful, B, was not related. You cannot prove that he was the person at the other end. C, there are, you know, I won't go into the detail because it'll bore everybody, but the very, at, at a very high level, they are trying to pretend that something is a legitimate process when it isn't. And then they are going to try and use that illegitimacy through the structures. So the only way Julian's um, case will be heard is A, through co us communicating to lots of people what's really going on through webinars like this, through people writing to their MPs, through uh, communications like John does, uh, John Reese does through, um, through the DEA, through public events, through talking to your neighbors and friends and your community groups and your trade unions. And if you're expecting justice in the British courts, it will have to be fought for really hard outside the court as well as inside the court. Inside the court, we have an ace team. What we need is lots of pressure outside the court, which is political and serious pressure. Thank you. Also, thanks to the folks from Veterans for Peace in the US who are saying they'd like to do a renewed campaign on dropping the charges in the US. Um, and, uh, you know, want to push that. So that sounds wonderful. Um, just point any Americans to that. Um, thank you for the code pink person. A couple of people are obviously asking on Julian's health. Um, doctors for Assange were concerned about the diagnosis of a mini stroke. Um, so what, what, what is the latest on that? And then also folks are asking, you know, given his health issues, are there grounds for, for any transfer to a, to a slightly less, you know, brutal uh, prison? Um, well, Julian, of course, is, his health is waning and uh, Nobody should, should be surprised, uh, given the circumstances of uh, sitting in, in Belmar's prison. Uh, the uh, the mini stroke was a, a, a huge warning. It uh, it uh, does not have a lasting impact when you intervene with uh, with uh, medication, but uh, to suffer that is often uh, uh, an indication that a full stroke. Uh, could happen. And that is, of course, uh, the situation that we are very worried about. So we are worried about his health and uh, his health is, is, uh, is uh, um, not good, but um, he is a very determined and strong person. He is, he is he's still uh, holding it in there, uh, but uh, we are worried, uh, transferred to another institution that has uh, not been seen as a possibility. And actually the prison authorities have been uh, maintaining that uh, Belmars is a better place than, than others in, in the UK. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't know if there's any possibility there, but I mean, this cannot go on forever. I would be seriously personally worried if, uh, if uh, he would have to sit there in for a, a much longer, um, that is just my personal opinion, but uh, uh, his life is in danger. That is just a certain thing we can, uh, for obvious reason, certify. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I think there are a few things. Firstly, Julian should not be in any prison, low security, high security or otherwise. Secondly, um, I think we have, at least for the people who are not in the UK, the, most of the British prisons are extremely Victorian, badly, um, badly with bad upkeep. So for example, last year for several months, Julian was left in the cold because there was no heating in the prison and he was not allowed his 
um, warm clothing from the basement because there was some excuse made about needing to sign some paperwork and because it was COVID, there was, the paperwork wasn't there is what I was told. But if you look at Craig Murray's imprisonment in Sockton Prison in Edinburgh, and you look at other um, good people who have been in various prisons around the UK, it's all much of a muchness. What we need to focus on is getting Julian out for good. And at, at the end of the day, we have to re realize that although Julian may be extremely resilient and extremely strong, and he is also a human being and he has, nobody knows the long-term effects of torture on the body. We know that Julian's body has already taken a beating. The mini stroke is an indication of that. But he's had other problems. While in the embassy, he had this tooth which needed a root canal and was not given treatment for seven years. Can you imagine living like that? Similarly, um, you know, he had a shoulder injury, which means that he's still having an arm impairment because that was never uh, dealt with and the British wouldn't allow him to leave. So if you expect this state to move him to a slightly nicer, comfy prison when they're not willing to grant him bail and not willing to grant him basic rights in um, Belmarsh, then I, I think that's a little bit of an optimistic expectation. Right now, the focus has to be on getting him out under any conditions. Uh, I think we lost deepest frozen, so I'm going to take... It is Daphne, Karyawana, Galicia or others, but um, Julian is still here and we have to do what it takes to get him out now while he's still alive and well, relatively well. Thanks, Deepa. Um, back to the sort of uh, polit political angle on the case. Stephanie asks, what is the veracity of politicians who say, we won't talk about this case as, it, it's, as it's before the court? I thought this was a rule they had to follow, but there are plenty of politicians who are talking about it. Um, is that something, who would like to take that? Well, well it is, sorry. John, go ahead. Uh, well, it, uh, there are some restrictions on what you can say about court cases, but the politicians use it as an excuse. Um, we're not requiring, and neither would it be very enlightening, to have your average MP carry on about the details of the legal case, despite the fact that quite a few of them are lawyers. What we're asking uh, for is comment on the political issues. What we're asking them to do is to, is to raise um, the issue of whether or not a, a journalist uh, should be treated like a spy. And this has started out as being a case about Julian Assange, the use of the United States Espionage Act um, against Julian Assange. The very, the very thing that uh, Mike Pompeo, when he was head of the CIA, um, said about WikiLeaks, that it's a hostile non-state intelligence agency, that is now being written in to the new draft of the Official Secrets Act in Britain. In other words, what started out as an issue of Julian Assange is now going to be, uh, become an issue for every single journalist in a new Official Secrets Act, which uh, seeks to treat them all as if, when they do things that the government doesn't like, they are actually the agents of a foreign power. So we always said that this would bleed in uh, to the political culture, and it is doing so uh, visibly and palpably. And therefore, the politicians really need to understand that this is not some arcane legal argument. It's not something where they're required to comment uh, on a judicial process which is ongoing. They're required to say something about the erosion of press freedom, about the erosion of freedom of speech. And quite frankly, if you're a politician that can't find it in yourself to say something about this issue, perhaps uh, another job in Sainsbury's should be beckoning. Awesome. Yeah, uh, somebody is pointing out here, Christine, I think, is that uh, uh, at least American politicians have not been uh, uh, shying away from uh, commenting on Julian Assange and uh, in a, a negative way, uh, but uh, they keep rather silent on the, the broader issue. But things are changing, and we are, of course, seeing a group of parliamentarians, uh, cross-political groups, uh, party political groups, in many countries now coming together, understanding the importance of the issue and, uh, and campaigning with us uh, uh, against the, the case against Julian. And the demand is drop the, uh, this case. 
Uh, this is growing uh, in many countries, and we see uh, more and more people willing to speak out. Uh, and even, uh, I mean, the former prime minister and foreign minister of Norway, Torben Jagland, who was uh, a member of the, the Nobel Prize Committee, uh, spoke out. Uh, so statesmen are starting to speak out. We are getting more and more uh, input from those circles. What is needed now uh, for, is for political leaders in other countries to show that they do uh, oppose this treatment. Uh, they don't have to do it for Julian per se, but for on the basis of the principle, which should be obvious to everybody and dozens of human rights organizations, free speech organizations are now seeing that uh, and uh, speaking out very forcefully against the case and urging the Biden administration to drop the case. Uh, so public support is big and people do care about this. Um, even in the United States, uh, even though uh, more people want to measure according to a new YouGov poll in the US um, than, uh, than, drop, than having the case dropped, there is a substantial portion of, of, of people in the US who are against this and are urging their, their president uh, uh, or the administration to drop the case. A uh, surprisingly big portion actually, given the fact that the media in the US, the mainstream media has been extremely negative in its uh, entire approach. Uh, and uh, actually the UK and the US media do stand out in their sort of negative uh, uh, reporting on Julian, but it is changing. This is changing uh, uh, day by day. And uh, uh, the more information that people are getting, uh, the more informed they are, the, uh, the more they care about the essence of the case. Uh, strangely, actually, which is uh, uh, came out in this Yugo poll is the, the fact that uh, uh, support for Julian's extradition is uh, stronger among Democrats than Republicans, which was, I find surprising, given the fact that we are talking about an indictment uh, uh, which revealed war crimes and dirty secrets of uh, Republican administration, which was hailed by the liberal establishment at the time. Uh, but now, Democrats are more leaning towards wanting him extradited than Republicans. So it, it shows, I think, the effect of, of uh, the failings of the media environment in that country. Um, but things are changing uh, and people are basically giving the mainstream media a signal. Uh, they are going elsewhere for the reporting uh, and uh, and in the end, they will get it. They cannot continue on the path that they have been on uh, with with their uh, very skewed uh, reporting uh, throughout the years. Thank you. Deepa, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to say is, if you look at Australia, the Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce has already come out mm -hmm. in support of Julian. If you look at Greece, uh, uh, prisoner, political prisoners who suffered during, um, during the, the Greek junta, et cetera, they've come out in support of Julian. Samely, similarly in Italy, in France, in Germany, we've had a, a coalition of politicians coming out to support Julian. And here in Britain, we have had, you know, um, Jeremy Corbyn speaking from the floor at SOAS and elsewhere saying, you know, the, the person who is the people's prime minister essentially saying that, uh, Julian should be free. So there is political will. You talked about why aren't they talking in Parliament? And I think the answer is that we need to put more pressure that we care about them bringing this up in Parliament and we need to find ways to introduce maybe the subjects if these people are uncomfortable with Julian. So things like press freedom, things like democracy into the debates at Parliament. I think there is a broader question to be asked about um, you know, why are we, we are all, of course, we are talking about don't extradite Assange, 
that at the end of the day, we need to talk about what WikiLeaks did. And a nice way of talking to people is explaining to them what Julian did that matters. And if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag why Assange matters and put in information about loads of things. Most people feel very nervous to talk about the case because it's gone on for 13 years. And unlike Kristen, they don't know the detail. There's a one page brief that I'm hoping Don't Extradite Assange will put in the chat that people can use to brief people who who are too ashamed to say, I don't know enough about the case or have been paying attention, but didn't weren't courageous enough to speak up. And our courage is contagious, as Julian has said. So we need to get other people to speak. And that, we do that by speaking up ourselves. On, on that subject, by the way, I mean, some of you will have seen, but, but it should be more widely publicized. Uh, Julian has just won a, a, a major anti-corruption organization award in, in, in France. And that stuff is, is, is worth publicizing far and wide because it puts him back in the category of campaigning journalist which is what he is, not a spy, not a prisoner, but a campaigning journalist. And that's, uh, you know, that's just one example recently. There are, there are, there are many. But the truth of the matter is, that actually, at the moment, that the majority of the print media in the United Kingdom are supportive of Julian Assange. That is now a fact. It's the Guardian's editorial line. We can all go into the history of what the Guardian did wrong, but as of now, it is the Guardian's editorial line to uh, stop the extradition of Julian Assange. It's the Telegraph's editorial line. It is the position of the uh, uh, Sunday Mail and the uh, Mail. Uh, this is now being mirrored in the Express, in the, um, in, the, um, in the Mirror. So those are very considerable mainstream print papers that now have a neutral or sympathetic and supportive position towards Julian Assange. And, and, and campaigners need to take this on board because it's our success. That didn't happen because they had some kind of Damascene conversion on the way down Fleet Street or something. That happened because people outside the mainstream media kept putting the argument. And in the end, it so coalesced with the facts as were presented that uh, it's become uh, more and more convincing. I know uh, Stella Morris was... Um, on the, the BBC being interviewed by Sarah Montague. Now, those of you who uh, still can bear to listen to the Today programme will know that this is flagship uh, core BBC journalism. Sarah Montague um, is actually a member of the aristocracy, a lady in her own right. Uh, she's deeply attached to the British es establishment. Um, it was a neutral interview. Now, that's as good as you get from the core of the BBC. So we're winning this argument and we're winning this argument because we're concentrating on, on the most important things about it, about not extraditing, about what's wrong with the case, about why journalism is important. And, and th this case is so long and so complex. There are so many issues that we've discussed tonight attached to it that, that the art here for campaigners is, is, not, uh, is not complexity. Complexity comes with the territory. The art here in campaigning is simplicity is boiling this down to clear, simple ideas, which millions of people who are still undecided, when they hear them, will be convinced. Yeah. John is absolutely right. This, this, is, a, this is not a, a complex case in its essence, and uh, it shouldn't be. It is simply about journalism and about uh, the vendetta to against a journalist for exposing the truth. Uh, the complexity is the tool of the opposition. That is the opposition that is trying to muddy the water. And uh, I often feel uh, that, uh, that I am doing injustice to Julian when I'm actually going into the legal details of the matter, because at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. It is not about the book of the law. It's a political case, as Deepa said, as John said, this is about politics and it will, uh, in my mind, at the end of the day, only be, be resolved through political measure and through the pressure of the general public who are out, should be outraged and are outraged uh, at what is going on.
Yeah, beautifully said. Actually, the other day I was speaking to some Brazilians who were sort of uh, brainstorming about how to help. And they'd been involved in the campaign to free Lula, the former president of Brazil. And they were saying the same thing. They were saying, look, we're not going to win this campaign by trying to get everyone educated on every twist and turn in the legal case. It's just too complicated. There's no way to follow it all. You know, this is over a decade. Um, it's, it's as, as you've all said, it's going to be one on politics, on campaigning and on simplicity. Um, so I think you've all said that really well. I just love to give a shout out to, was it Karen in Sydney um, and your group uh, that's sat, standing outside the town hall? Um, thank you for doing that. And I think, again, you know, as John was saying, we've got more support than ever, more mainstream support than ever. I'm going to look forward to listening to Stella on the BBC. Um, a few people are mentioning um, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils, I always mess, it, mess up his name, Nils Melsner, um, and he has a book coming out, is it in February? Does anyone want to speak to that? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to. Sorry, go ahead, John. So, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, yes, it is coming out, and we're working with the publishers, Verso, um, about doing public events around that in this uh, in, in this country, so... Um, yeah, I've got an advanced copy of the book. It looks absolutely fantastic. Um, important moment in the an important campaigning tool. Wonderful. And, and, and you, John, I think, have, have spoken so well about how Nils has done a really uh, beautiful job in encouraging people to kind of, you know, just welcoming people to evolve their position. You know, he evolved his position. I think uh, was it Rebecca at Reporters Without Borders evolved her position and just sort of welcoming people on the journey, you know, being a really inclusive movement. And he wrote a beautiful piece about how, how he, he went on that journey himself. And I think there's a lot to be learned there. Um, sorry, Deepa, were you going to say something? I was just going to say that Niels's book is now, but if you order via Verso, you will get a copy at home now because I've got my copy. And um it's, it's really worth reading the book because Niels is honest about various things, which people feel really um, uncomfortable asking questions about certain things. But Niels has been extremely honest, including about his visit to Belmarsh and what Julian looked like while he was in prison and about uh, the bigger picture issues. So he's very he has a lot of empathy with Julian, but also an understanding of how the broader democratic processes work and how things work in within the system. Um, I think there's also a lot of knowledge within that book, which I think people will enjoy reading, but I would encourage people, if you feel able as a Christmas present or as a birthday present, to, and to give those copies of those books to friends and family, but also to target them at politicians and journalists who might not have picked up the book otherwise, but might be drawn in by Niels, Niels's writing to try and understand what's going on. And the more people who understand, because Niels wrote the book as an account, because he says in the book that normally a UN special rapporteur will not write a book about a case. And it's not just about this case that he's concerned about. He's concerned about the big picture issues when he's writing this book. He's concerned about the fact that Britain and America and Sweden are not engaging in good faith with the UN process. So if you have friends who work for the UN or for the EU, pass on the book to them and get them to have a look. Maybe they will change their mind. And the more people we have within the system who are little subversives, who understand what's going on, little agents for change, the better for Julian. And the sooner we get him out. Great. I was asked a question by a, by a friend abroad about the UK Supreme Court, and, and this might be more of a, a lawyer question and maybe it's more of a stellar question, but they were asking, you know, uh, uh, should activists be trying to get the attention of the su Supreme Court members in some way? You know, how does the Supreme Court sort of lean, you know, politically? So what, it, what are your thoughts there on you know, when, when folks are campaigning in terms of their targets, um, should they just continue as, as normal or, or should, should they be focusing in any way on the, on the British Supreme Court? May I just jump in with a quick comment before, I mean, I'm sure John will give the official campaign line and what John wants people to do. But I, I think where I've seen other cases, 
we have to recognize that although judges seem completely removed from us um, in many ways and come from a different, often from a different social class and other things, they do read the papers and they do see the news and they do, if you have protests and visible signs in places, they do come across them, much as they, they think they are being independent and impartial. So I don't think this is a me- this is a mechanism of, you know, putting pressure on the judges or anything else, but at least bringing to their attention that people are interested and that we're looking. And at every stage of this court process, that is one of the reasons that people like me have queued in the early hours to get into court, so that judges know that everybody is looking at them, and that forces a, over time some amount of change in the way they engage with it because the, when they can get away with things people tend to lose you know put down their guard and do things as the way that is more that is the path of least resistance and if we make enough resistance for them to think about it that might be useful but sorry to jump in there john thank you well, maybe John is better to sort of explain the, the composition of the Supreme Court. I'm not a English, I'm not British, uh, but I am told that uh, the Supreme Court is, is rather uh, conservative uh, uh, as it is uh, 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 with the members who are on the Supreme Court now. Um, uh, so uh, uh, whether that will have an effect on the outcome uh, remains to be seen. But maybe Johnny will have uh, more details on the, on the, on the individual sitting in the Supreme Court now. Yeah, well, I mean, just, just uh, if people don't know, the the Supreme Court, um, well, it's only really been called that comparatively recently. It is, in fact, a sort of department of the House of Lords. Uh, the law lords sit in uh, that the House of Lords. They're part of it. Um, and, of course, Britain now has the, the largest unelected upper chamber in the world apart from the Chinese state. Um, so they're surrounded by and part of, embedded in, one might say, uh, one of the most conservative parts of the political, uh, of the political system. Um, and, and the way to change, I mean, I, I don't believe kind of personally lobbying whoever turns out to be the judge in the Supreme Court um, will be particularly effective. In fact, it might well be counterproductive. Um, but they do have very, very sensitive political antennae. You know, when you get to this level, they are essentially politicians. They are legally informed, legally trained politicians, and they are acting in ways which protect the interests of the British establishment. That's how it works. You know, the the one of the older and one of the better um, textbooks on the on the British judiciary, the the politics of the judiciary by a fantastic guy called uh, J. A. G. Griffiths um, said that the law is politics by other means, and at this level, that's absolutely true. So the way to affect them is to affect the political environment in which they're operating. And we should never believe that people at this level don't understand what's going on at street level politically. They understand it very, very well. They have it reported to them. In considerable detail and with considerable uh, and with considerable uh, analysis, um, I, I know that when we, uh, you know, I was part of organising the demonstrations against the Iraq War for the Stop the War Coalition. Of course, you all saw the the press figures, the massive underestimates uh, for the numbers that turned out on those demonstrations. But we know for a fact because Claire Short, who was a government minister at the time said that the cabinet was uh, receiving independent reports of entirely accurately what the size of those demonstrations was, what the mood on them was, uh, and that was affecting uh, their judgment. So they get an accurate picture, even if the press doesn't reproduce it, the politicians get an accurate picture of what protesters and campaigners are, uh, are, are, are doing. So um, the way to affect the judges uh, is to affect the political environment, essentially uh, to make it more politically painful to go ahead with the extradition than it is to drop it. And if the government, and we are now blessed with a spectacularly weak government, 
Um, you know, Boris is counting the days that he can hang on. And if he goes, Pretty Patel will go. So it's a vulnerable government. So um, uh, the more protest we have uh, and the more focused and effective it is, uh, the more we'll change the political environment in which the judges will make their decision. Beautifully said, and I think that's a, a beautiful note to start wrapping things up on. Um, can I ask for just like some maybe some final, you know, closing comments from from each of you? And there was a couple of questions I didn't want to ignore around is Julian receiving mail is is a, do we know if he's, you know, reaching uh, any of the letters sent to him are reaching him right now? I don't know who might know about that. Um, but beyond that, if you'd be kind enough to make some closing comments and a huge thank you for everyone in this meeting. We can see you all organizing and sharing contacts. And I know it's all sorts of times all over the world. So thank you. You are doing amazing work. Yes, uh, if I can answer this, yes, he is receiving mail. Yes. Uh, closing thoughts. I mean, the fight continues. And I'm, I'm really uh, uh, grateful for the, the big and growing support we've had. It has uh, had an impact and it will have an impact. and it. Uh, will uh, have a, a, an impact on, on the future of Julian and the future of journalism. So we cannot give in. We have to try to escalate our work uh, uh, in the coming weeks because it's, uh, we're coming to a pivotal point here. Uh, and of course, at the end of the day, this is, this is a, a, a question of putting through any means possible, a pressure on the Biden administration to drop the case entirely. That, of course, is the only solution. It uh, uh, to to uh, thwart the extradition is, is is one element. It will save Julian's life. Yes, but we need to take it further. And the simplest way is to to pressure the American administration to drop the case and to point out that it's just unacceptable for his legacy uh, and for the future journalism uh, to have this going on. And the scandal that the Biden administration and Biden himself is not intervening directly and doing the same thing as uh, his predecessor Obama decided that was not to go ahead with uh, the indict indictment Julian Assange. The Biden administration is taking over this heritage from the Trump administration. Why on earth are they doing this? Why on earth are they keeping this legacy of Trump and Mike Pompeo going? Uh, we know the animosity from, from that camp. And uh, I am certain it will get through in the end that they will see that this is not a political legacy that they want to have on their hands. Uh, and, you know, there are frequent elections in the US. This is something that matters. They should uh, know that there are consequences on the international level. We need uh, politicians in other countries to speak out forcefully. And we need people all over the world to point out that this has to end. This has to end. Thank you. Deepa, would you like to make any last remarks and then we'll go to John. Thanks. Um, firstly, I think we have to remember that, you know, 789 Muslim men were tortured, raped, beaten, you know, horrendously treated at Guantanamo. WikiLeaks revealed that millions of people have been displaced and killed in the Iraq and Afghan wars. And they have... We all, if we care about, if you're a Democrat and you care about Black Lives Matter, care about the Black lives in the Middle East that have been destroyed by US foreign policy, care about us knowing the truth about what happened there. If, if you're somebody who cares about the environment, care about what WikiLeaks does, and talk to your friends and colleagues about what WikiLeaks does and what it revealed about the traffic euro dumps or about um, you know, other environmental protections which were being eroded through the cable gate releases. And then otherwise talk to people about things that matter to them, corruption in Kenya where Daniel Arap Moy and others were um, engaging in corrupt activities, whether it is the um, you know, Tunisian, the revolution in, in terms of uh, sparking the Arab Spring. 
think about all these things and talk to people because those issues might be things that people can relate to, even if they can't relate to Julian. And do make an effort to speak to even politicians who are useless, because at some point they will come to you for your vote. And it is important that when they come to you for your vote, you tell them that Assange matters. And even before they come to you to vote, when you're on Twitter, when you're on social media, when they write about, when Blinken writes about press freedom, tag him and say, what are you talking about press freedom? Well, ratio his tweets and get them to start feeling afraid that if they continue to target Julian, we will continue to target them because that's what WikiLeaks was, was about, us surveilling the state, not the state surveilling us. And we have to keep to that and we have to fight because only if we fight, we will win. If we give up, we have already lost. So we have to fight now. Thank you. Please, beautifully said, John, thank you. Yes, uh, so, uh, so briefly, just, to, just to, um, to recap what we've been saying in the, in the, in the discussion. Uh, first of all, I absolutely agree with, 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 uh, with Deepa. We have to, we have to um, target and, uh, and try to influence all politicians. And she's right to say target the useless ones, because if we just kept it to the good ones, it'd be a small job. Um, so do, uh, do get on to that. Um, in terms of the case, um, here's where we are. Uh, there were a number of questions, and some people have said in the chat, and quite rightly, I think, some of the most important political questions in this case, uh, which we lost on in the magistrate's court uh, decision. And had this judgment, the recent one uh, to appeal to the Supreme Court, gone the other way, that is, had they said, no, you can't appeal uh, to the Supreme Court, then there would have been a, uh, uh, another new appeal launched on all those questions, the freedom of press, the political expression, the political exemption clause of the extradition treaty, all of those uh, would have been then the subject of a fresh appeal. But because the uh, court decided that we could pursue the argument about the assurances um, and the United States um, ability or not to be able to introduce those at a late stage in the whole proceedings after indeed the trial had finished, then we will pursue those and are going to take that opportunity to pursue them uh, to the Supreme uh, Court if the Supreme Court agrees to hear them, which uh, I think is, is likely. Um, just to clarify that point, this is a, a two-stage process. The court decision that's just happened was an agreement by the existing High Court judges who ruled uh, against uh, Julian that there was a point of law that could still be further contested and that we had the right to appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court now has to say, yes, we agree with that and we will hear it. So that's what we're waiting for next. Probably won't hear it uh, for another 10 weeks, perhaps. But um, whatever happens in the courts, whether it's decided finally in the Supreme Court, whether we have to go back to another appeal, whatever happens, if there is a bail uh, application or not, Whatever happens in the courts happens in a political context, which is not set by the courts, not decided by the lawyers, but is decided by the political process outside the courts, amongst the general public, in the press, on the social media, and that's where we come in. We, and only we, this isn't something that the lawyers can do. They have their job, they do it well, but they can't do this. They can't affect the general political mood. That's what campaigners do. So, and I say this at every uh, uh, meeting we have with the campaign, it doesn't matter how little you do. There is no such thing as too little. If you're just liking or sharing a Facebook post, that's fine. If you're signing a petition, that's fine. If you're starting a petition, that's better. If you're organizing a meeting, great. If you're advertising a meeting, fantastic. If you're coming on a protest or a picket or down outside the court, that's brilliant too. Because altogether, those elements make up an effective campaign. All campaigning, all mass campaigning, all the really great campaigns, whether you're talking about CND or you're talking about the civil rights movement or you're talking about Stop the War, all of those movements are mosaics of small acts taken by individuals, uh, either individually or collectively. That's what we're trying to build in the DEA. That's what all the campaigners around Assange are trying to do. Get stuck in, do a little bit more, help a little bit more, publicize a little bit more, and we'll get there. Thanks very much.
Thank you so much. This has been a great meeting. And thank you to everyone in this meeting who is doing who are doing all the things that John has been talking about. So have a, have a good evening, good weekend, and uh, I'm sure we'll be meeting again before too long. Thanks so much. Thanks good evening. Bye. Thank you.